there's another product out there, right? You were talking about cortisone injections, but there's the triamcinolone acetonide, extended release, he took a deep breath, injectable suspensions. What is this compared to the steroids we've been using? So this is basically just an extended release uh, classic steroid. Triamcinolone and cetonitis, well, we typically occur, uh, that we typically refer to affectionately as Kenalog. Um, but this triamcinolone acetonide is coupled to a nanoparticle of polylactocoglycolic acid, which enables it to sort of stay in this nanoparticle, uh, this microsphere, until exposed to an aqueous environment, and then has a very sustained, slow release into the joint. The implication is, is that you don't get a huge surge in steroid in the joint. You don't get the systemic absorption that creates the glucose control issues, the hypothalamic pituitary axis alterations and such. But what you do get is a lower level of steroid in the joint, which we think may be beneficial in terms of local cartilage damage. And clinically, you get a sustained, quick onset of action, sustained uh, clinical impact, the signal of which is stronger than almost any other injection that we have available to us. So can you put a number on sustained? How long does it last? So the, the studies that have been done suggest that all the way out to three months, patients have significant improvement in the scores that we were talking about before, Womac, COOS, um, uh, quality of life, as well as rescue medications. And there's currently a study going on that I actually am personally involved in as well that is looking at the need for a second dose. And we're seeing patients where this product is lasting four to five months in terms of clinical impact before patients actually require a secondary injection. And how does that compare to standard steroids? So they, they did a randomized controlled trial comparing standard steroid injections versus uh, the new extended release. And uh, it appears the extended release had markedly longer uh, efficacy. I'm going to ask you again, what's the number? markedly longer compared to um, several weeks or months longer. So it's important to realize, because I've read all of these articles, uh, the pain doesn't go to zero with any of these. With, generally with steroids, if your pain is five, it's going to take you down to a four or a three. So I think some of these uh, findings can be statistically significant. How clinically relevant they are, I'm not sure. One of the things that, uh, that I, I see some downsides to this product is, doesn't this, doesn't this have to be reconstituted with a diluent, diluent before you inject it? So I would be concerned that the sterile technique has got to be absolutely perfect with this product. And I can tell you, some of our physician's assistants, I'd be worried about this. The other thing is, to my knowledge, the, both the safety and efficacy of this product in repeated administration has not been tested. Is that so there's correct? A repeated, at, there's a repeat dosing study that's going on it's now. It's going on now, but it has not yet been proven. The repeat dosing has not yet been okay. proven or assessed. I but I do to want to push back on one thing because you mentioned statistical significance. So um, you mentioned earlier the AOS guidelines. Um, they were quite controversial with regard to, in particular, visco supplementation. But the metric that was utilized was an MCII, the minimally clinically important improvement from baseline. And what I would say with regard to that is that while that statistical instrument is somewhat controversial in how you use it, the current study that is yet to be published but in press right now of the phase three study on uh, uh, triamcinolone acetonide extended release will demonstrate that the statistical significance is not just statistical, but it's actually clinically relevant relative to the MCI thresholds that were set by the AAOS guidelines. So I think that this is demonstrating what I said, a higher signal, a higher statistically significant signal and clinically meaningful signal that really differentiates it in my opinion and in my personal experience from other now, steroids. let me ask you this. If it lasts so long in the joint, do you think the three-month, you think if the patient's going to have a total knee, you think we should uh, extend that out to six months uh, after the extended release? So that's injectable? really, a, 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 that's, that's a, a, a huge unanswered question right now, and I would share your concern with regard to that. We don't see any clinical evidence of residual um, mm -hmm. and no uh, bio, biochemical a residual uh, of the product within the joint at that time frame, but the concern uh, is certainly a realistic one. And so then the question becomes, how do you stratify your patients in terms of whether they need to dance at the wedding but have their, th their, 
their total knee in three months, or do you look at uh, the patient who is looking for sustained non-surgical management right. and That's not considering Right, that's where I think there, there may be a role for this, uh, but. And does the extended release product work as quickly as a standard injection? So it turns out that, that in the studies that they've done, uh, phase two, phase three, the onset of action seems to be within that 24 to 48 hour period. So yes is the short answer. It Correct. works just as fast, it just lasts longer? Correct. Yeah. So explain this in terms of the microsphere technology, because now I'm confused. I thought that it would release it more slowly and probably ramp up over time. So it turns out that when we normally give a CC or two of Kenalog, we oversaturate or saturate plus a lot of excess. That's to cover uh, the, re the, the decay over time. Correct, but, but, the, but the bottom line is that we, we give way more than we probably need to saturate the steroid receptors and the cell surface uh, receptors that actually activate and create the impact mm -hmm. within the joint. And what this product we think is doing is saturating those receptors while not overshooting, so you don't get the leakage systemically, but uh, uh, creating the clinical impact that we're looking for. So are there particular cautions you need in terms of what he brought up, in terms of reconstituting this drug? You don't just swab it with alcohol and go? So, so clearly there is a reconstitution step, um, and the reconstitution step, uh, there's proprietary technology that they have little kits that come with it to make it, but absolutely, I mean, you have to, you have to do this in a sterile fashion, no question about it. I, I saw your face. So, well, I, I personally think that it's a level of complication uh, that if we're in one of my institutions, we delegate this to the LPNs or PAs where I have to tell you, they just change the needle um, and they do the injection. They're not, they're swabbed the knee once. So I, I'm a little concerned. I think you, you have to have perfectly good sterile technique when you're using this. So does the company provide instruction or? Yeah, it's um, a little kit that has actually uh, sort of foolproof way of actually getting the diluent into the product and, uh, and it's actually quite a nice, uh, uh, quite a nice setup. It's very easy to do. And while I share your concern, Paul, mm -hmm. uh, I would say that having personally done it, it's, it's, it's not hard. It's something that you get into the workflow and you can do very carefully okay. and sterilely. I mean, if you're concerned with this, you've got to be really concerned with doing PRP and stem cell injections in an well, office. Well, I don't do those. I don't, <laughs> I don't either. Just saying that's even, that's people are even doing more. bone marrow harvest and yeah. then, you know. I mean, look, it, it, when we're, we're discussing this, let's be very clear what we're discussing. We're discussing injections into a closed space which needs to be sterile, and whether you inject steroids, local anesthetics, or anything, that's the risk, right? You have to be good with your aseptic technique, whether it's this drug or any drug. And particularly with something that really, like steroid of any kind, has the potential to immunomodulate the, the local environment. And I think that's, that's always been the fear uh, and and the, the data we shared earlier where really it does seem to alter the ability of the joint environment to fight infection even in the face of a joint replacement. Can, can I bring concerning. up something, Peter, just for oh something God, no, we'll I've fall noticed. Apart if you ask a question. Something I've noticed <clears throat> over the last uh, year and a half that I have noticed when I do a knee arthroplasty in a patient who's had multiple HA injections, that knee is more fibrotic that there's the synovium is this grayish silver, uh, and then patients who have multiple steroids, you can tell there's crystals all over their joint. Do you, you know, I've, I've always often asked, I wonder if this changes the outcome of the total need. Do you know any data on that, Rich? So the only data that I'm aware of is that there are infectious disease and, and bacterial um, characterizations of normal joint fluid that there are, there, are, there are remnants of bacteria in every yes, joint. And the question is whether those live in every joint, um, get introduced, or whatever. The theory from Dr. Pravizi is that those, those bacteria live in that joint, and that we may be activating those bacteria with these agents sometimes, causing some of these reactions. I mean, it's scary if, um, this, is, if this is true. I mean, uh, yeah, I have not seen what, what about you, what the you fibrotic. Uh, I haven't seen. Maybe that. it's just anecdotal. Then, so. We we published an article a while back uh, looking at uh, synovial samples in patients who had had severe acute inflammatory reactions, mm -hmm. um, and in patients who had been exposed to HA. Uh, and uh, there was 
uh, ultimately, between those that were exposed and those that were not, there was no significant difference in terms of granulomatous disease or those kinds mm -hmm. of things. But we didn't but I think look the, at ne the next issues. step for big data would be to, if they could somehow get ranges of motions after total knee in patients who've had, say, three or more HA or steroid injections versus people who didn't have any. I think more likely than a chemical reaction to the HA would be bleeds related to the infection. Yeah. You know, well, the maybe injection. that's it. Maybe I it's mean, something other, uh, there's like another factor. Maybe subclinical yeah, bleeds or, over time. Uh, maybe not so subclinical.